Hey guys, I'm Amanda the Red Witch Bitch and today I want to talk about science within magic. Now a lot of people say that, you know, magic is science that is yet to be recognized and that science and magic are two completely separate principles and separate things completely. But a lot of scientific laws and principles can be used to describe how magic acts. And I'm going to be going over some of those today. But before we get started, I just want to ask y'all to hit the like button, hit subscribe, hit that little bell so you get notified whenever I make a new video. And make sure to keep up with me wherever I am. That is going to be Instagram, Discord, and here on YouTube. All of those things will be linked down below. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about today is the scientific method. The scientific method offers a objective methodology for scientific experimentation that results in unbiased interpretations of said scientific experiments and can refine the knowledge that is already there. It does look like a little flowchart, so I'm going to put it up right here. So you would use all of this to kind of make an assumption, make a prediction or a hypothesis within science following all of these steps. So using the scientific method, you can prove and disprove your own hypothesis with this little flowchart. Within magic and metaphysics, we can apply this as well. Number one, make an observation. This can be done in the form of seeing a spell done on the internet, trying to figure out what it does, why it was done, all of this stuff. It's observing the spell as it is. Number two, ask a question. How do you form this spell? How can I apply this to my own practice? How does this spell operate? Number three, form a hypothesis that answers that question. So if you want XYZ spell, you need to analyze how you would accomplish this, or you would need to research outside of what you already know in order to accomplish that. Whether that is a different form of magic, a different form of energy work, um, different herbs that you have to use that you have to source and analyze how you would do this spell effectively for you and yourself. This is the planning stage of any spell. Number four, do an experiment. This is where you cast the spell and you try to see how it works for you. You can keep track of all of your notes, all of your, um, you know, magic methodology inside your grimoire or anything that you want to track your progress and your results with the spell. Maybe something didn't quite go right after a few weeks of observation after the spell was completed. Write that down. Maybe it worked better than you expected. Write that down. That falls into number five is analyzing the results. This is where you track the progress of the entire spell. And you'll see down at the bottom, we have the hypothesis is incorrect and hypothesis is correct. Two little options right here. So if this spell didn't work, you would go to hypothesis is incorrect and go back up to the top and then try it all again. This is just how we use magic and how we form spells. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing that I have stretched to fit into a scientific box. It's just the way that it is. You find something that you want to do. You research how to do that. You source the materials, you do the spell, you analyze the results, and you see if it worked. If it doesn't, you go right back to the top and you try it again until it does work. That is Witchcraft 101. The second thing I want to talk about today is going to be quantum physics within spirituality, metaphysics, and magic. Now, I love quantum physics so much. It is so interesting. I love it. But it is kind of hard to explain um, and to grasp at first that I do recognize. So if you do want to learn more about this, I will be linking other videos here on YouTube that can help explain it better than I ever could. But within this video, this is just going to be a rough explanation for it. This is just bare bones, okay? We're not going to, we're, it's not the meaty bits, it's just the bones, just bones. So within quantum physics, particles are measured as waves. This is a vibrational frequency. Waves are vibrations and they are movements essentially, right? So in magic, you can think of the particle as energy and the vibration of the energy making the wave or energy being measured by its vibration or frequency, sort of. I don't like to go into the frequencies of vibrations and shit of energy because uh, I just don't. But that's a whole other thing. We're not going to that today. Back to it. So the bare bones thing I wanted to explain within quantum physics relating to energy and magic is uh, two analogies that I wanted to bring up that I really liked. When I was learning about quantum physics, somebody had explained it in these ways and my brain just clicked and went magic. That's it. So imagine for a second you're taking a bouncy ball and you go bounce, bounce, catch, bounce, bounce, catch, bounce, bounce, catch. So at some point in quantum physics, that ball isn't going to return, but rather pass right through the wall that it was bouncing off of. In magic, you have the energy, you cast the spell, 
and that spell, you know, if you cast it inside your home and it's for protection, the bouncy ball is going to stay within the walls, right? If you're casting outside of yourself, outside of your home or whatever. Now this applies to all magic. And I'm just using these two as an example, like protection and hexes. So let's say you cast a hex or protection or healing for somebody else. Bounce, bounce through the wall. Bounce, bounce, catch. Bounce, bounce through the wall. That magic is going through the wall and is going to affect things on the outside of that wall, going to the other person, traveling through to the other person. Now, the other analogy can help explain this further, which I really like. It's, you know, I'm really not doing it very much justice, but just bear with me. I am very sorry. <laughs> the other analogy is a pebble in a pond. So you drop the pebble into the pond and you see all of the waves coming off of it, right? So let's say after a bit, those waves hit a stick that is in the middle of the pond. Well, within quantum physics and quantum tunneling, there is a chance for that pebble to pop up right from that stick where the wave was interrupted. That is the spell being cast by you, pebble dropped into the pond, and traveling to the other person and popping up right where they are, affecting them for better or for worse. So magic and intentions are like waves, right? The waves from a particle. Vibrations are wavelengths. Wavelengths can show up at a subatomic level, but they originate from us. Your brain is firing neurons all the time. And every thought that your brain has basically creates energy and a wavelength that potentially could be measured. We are the origin of these vibrations, these wavelengths that we put out into the world. We can't measure where our thoughts are going until they reappear, like the pebble in the pond. When the spell has done its job to protect you or you cast a hex and it hits the person that you were intending to hit, then we can see it reappear. But for a brief moment in time, that disappears. The spell and the energy that you put out into the world, poof, gone. This is a perfect example of quantum physics in metaphysics. The third thing I wanna go over is Schrodinger's cat. I personally love Schrodinger's cat. I think it's the coolest thing. Like, I have Schrodinger cat pins, like enamel pins that I put on my fucking jacket. I love it. So with Schrodinger's cat, uh, the cat is alive and dead, right? Pretty simple stuff. This is an observer's principle. I'm briefly gonna go over the experiment. I don't remember all of it because my brain is that of a goldfish, so bear with me. Basically, Schrodinger put a cat into his you know, into a box. His cat? A cat? I don't know. Maybe his cat. And the box was supposed to be like irradiated or there was a poisonous gas that was filling it and the cat had like a 50% chance of living and a 50% chance of dying. So for a brief moment in that experiment, the cat was both alive and dead because there was no way to see if the cat was alive and had succumbed to the deadly radiation or poisoning or whatever the fuck, or if it wasn't a high enough dosage to actually kill it. We cannot know the state of a particle or an experiment unless it is actively being observed upon. Now this is, you know, pretty standard, but it's also like if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, did it even... <laughs> if a tree falls in the forest and no one was around to hear it, did it even make a sound? It has to be observed upon, it has to be listened to. So you could say, it both did make a sound and it didn't make a sound. So this can be applied to chaos magic. It is suggested within chaos magic that you do not care about the outcome of your spell one way or another. Whether it succeeds or fails is not your concern. This is so you don't let your ego get in the way and screw everything up for yourself. When you cast that spell, the spell both succeeded and failed at the same time. But you'll never know if it truly did unless it is actively being observed upon. And unless you were actively observing the subject or victim of your spell. Now for the last law principle sciencey thing, we're going to be going over the Newtonian laws and how they apply to magic. Now we have three Newtonian laws, the law of inertia, the second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration, and the third law that is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now for the first law, the law of inertia, this law states that objects want to stay in rest or motion unless an outside force causes a change. For example, if you roll a ball down a hill, it will continue rolling unless friction or something else stops it by force. You can also think about the way that when you hit the brakes on your bike really hard, your body continues to move forward. Now, when we create a spell, it's like pushing a ball and creating that motion and moving it to where you want to go. Kind of like golfing, for example. Your spell, the club, moves the ball 
reality to your desired location to achieve a desired result. Now you aren't bending reality to your will, you are simply guiding it. But the force that would stop this spell is somebody else's ward catching it. Or maybe somebody's ward doesn't catch it and it continues on. And it continually creates that motion in your space, in your reality, in your life. The second law is the law of force equals mass times acceleration. The second law states that acceleration of an object is dependent upon two variables, the net force acting upon the object and the mass of the object. The force of the energy you put behind a spell will drive it further. This is why you need materials, intentions, manifestations, and your own energy to power and drive the spell. Your spell will not do what you need it to do if you just light a candle and work off of thoughts and prayers. You need to drive it, you need to give it force. Your spell, mass, has your energy and the materials of the spell acting upon it, force, to drive it to accomplish your will in a timely manner, which is acceleration. Now for the third law, this is the law of action and reaction. Now I want to make this abundantly clear that I do not mean the threefold law. That is not at all what we're talking about today. I am not Wiccan, I do not believe in the threefold law. If you do, that is perfectly peachy keen fine but Wicca is its own religion and therefore should not really have a place when witchcraft is being discussed because they are two separate things. You can be Wiccan and practice witchcraft, but not everybody who practices witchcraft is Wiccan, which is the case for me. So we're not talking about the threefold law. The third Newtonian law is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Newton's third law states that when two bodies interact, they apply force to one another that are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. The third law is also known as the law of action and reaction. Within spell work, we can see this similarly to the universal exchange of energy. If you're performing a hex, the equal reaction to the spell will be the subject succumbing to the effects of your spell. But the opposite reaction will be the energy drain on your part in accordance to the first and second law. The output of energy that you expend can be the opposite reaction, not the threefold law. If a small object interacts with a large object, the small one will feel more force than the large one. In this way, you, the larger object, are exerting more force on the smaller object, the subject of the hacks. Now this isn't about who's bigger, who's badder, it's just science and, you know, the scientific principles and theories and laws and shit and their presence within magic. Now there are a ton of different scientific theories and principles and laws that I did not go over today, but you can find all of them in the Discord. This is the Archive of the Cobalt Soul. It's a huge online Discord grimoire and it's completely free. Some of the scientific subjects that I did not go over today that you can find in the Discord are going to be string theory, theory of relativity, science of meditation, science of lucid dreaming, auras, astral projection, reincarnation, psychology of shadow work, the weight of a soul, medicinal herbs, the Fermi paradox, brain crystals, sleep paralysis. So all of this and more can be found in the Discord. If you don't necessarily like Discord or you can't work it, we I understand, but it is worth a shot. It, it does have a learning curve, but you get used to it. If you're more of a book person, I have one for you. Now we don't really talk a whole lot about science and magic in here, but I do go over a bit of how magic affects the real world and how it is kind of reality bending, how I mentioned earlier. This is the Practical Practitioner's Guide to Magic and Witchcraft. This is, this is the book that I wrote. You can find it on Amazon as a paperback and a ebook and hard covers are coming soon. If you like less science and you like more mythology, then we also have something else for you. <laughs> this is Pandemos Mythos. This is a Patreon that me and my friend Viola started and we talk about mythology from a pagan perspective. It's really fun and we have a lot of cool shit planned. We release videos every 10 days and first tier is $7.77. That's about all I have for you today, but if you have any suggestions for upcoming content that you want to see or something that you specifically want to learn, let me know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more because a lot of cool content is on its way. Links for all of the scientific principles and everything I have covered today will also be in the description box below as well as the Discord links and everything else that you'll need to know. So until next time, I will see you later. Have fun and happy witching.